Welcome to One Plus One, I'm Rosie Batty. Domestic violence in gay relationships is often not talked about, let alone sung about. But for performer Russell Vickery, that's exactly how he's reclaimed his voice. Russell came out in his 40s and later became trapped in an abusive relationship with another man. He's since written a cabaret about it and that set him on an unexpected path. Russell Vickery, welcome to One Plus One. Thanks for having me. You've been touring your cabaret show, My The Closet, for over eight years, mm -hmm. across the country on many stages. Did you always want to be a performer? I was always interested in singing. Uh, and as a little boy was, you know, involved in choirs and whatever, um, but I spent like a big gap of it, not doing anything. Then when the opportunity for My Other Closet uh, presented itself, I thought, well, I've done the singing thing, but like, have, I've never really done acting and I'm not quite sure how I'm going to go with that. Um, but I think what made it easier for me was the fact that, you know, it was my own story. So I actually didn't really have to act. Mm. It was just me going back to places or, or thinking about things that had, uh, had gone on. And yeah, I was, um, yeah, eight years we've been doing it and still doing it actually, still doing it, Rosie. You grew up in regional Victoria in the 60s and 70s. I was born in Geelong in the late 50s actually, yeah. I was youngest son of two, a very working class Mm -hmm. family. Pretty unremarkable childhood. You know, I came from a great family and, you know, knew there was lots of love and, well, you know, I mean, I had a dad that I never, I don't remember him ever not working. I had a mum who was at home with me all the time until I was, uh, I think, grade three. Um, yeah, and just a, a very happy, great childhood, really. And as a young man, you kept the fact that you were gay secret and what were the reasons for that? Why did you feel the need to do that? Uh, society was very different in those days, Rosie. Um, I grew up going to school in primary school where, you know, the, the lessons that I learnt were uh, boys will be boys, mm. you know, don't be too soft, don't be too gentle, don't be gay. Um, and Whilst you're living in a society where that society says to you, um, these, are the, these are the rigid gender norms that we expect you to follow, you don't come out. Simple as that, you don't come out. And, you know, I always took my hat off to, to people in my teenage years that had the guts to do it because they, 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 it was just a backlash. And I understand that you experienced a horrendous homophobic attack whilst you were young. And yeah. I think what, what really upset me when I learnt that, Russell, was that you couldn't go to anybody. Yeah, I, look, again, I've often thought about that one. And, and, and to, just to, to fill you in yeah. on the story, I'd gone to a, um, a, gay, a gay nightclub in St Kilda called Pokies. Um, and I'd come downstairs and I was standing on Fitzroy Street and I was having a cigarette. You know, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a couple of guys come running up towards me and they were holding a badge. Told me that they were the police, grabbed me, threw me into a car and there was two other guys in the car waiting for me. Um, and they drove me off and they drove me around to the back of a, 
um, park in a secluded sort of park area, dragged me out of the car, two of them held me down and the other two just you know, punched and kicked and laughed and, um, you know, they were you know, talking about, you know, what a great night it was, poof the bashing and, you know, all that sort of gear. Anyway, they, um, they obviously tired of it um, and uh, thankfully, because I think if they had to keep going, there's every chance I'll, I, we wouldn't be having this discussion today, you know. Um, and uh, they took off in the car and left me. Um, I managed to crawl across the park onto a main road and the very first car that drove past pulled up. Um, I've got no idea who that guy was, who that guy was and, um, you know, if he's watching this, like, thank you so much because I never got the opportunity to really thank him. He, um, he wanted to take me to the hospital. Now, number one, I thought, I thought, and even today, I don't, was it the police? Was it not the police? I don't know. I don't know, but I wasn't prepared to take the risk. Number two, you know, I'd, I'd been brought up in a society that was basically telling me that what I just received was what I deserved. And number three, if I had have gone there, had have gone to the, to the, to the hospital, wouldn't, would they have told me that I just got what I deserved? Would they call the police? Did I really want the police involved if they'd just done this to me? And, and you, clearly your parent, your family weren't aware of no. your secret, so no. you've... Not at all, not at yeah. all. So my choice was to get this person to take me to a friend's place. I didn't know how damaged I was. Mm. I mean, you know, uh, internally, I had no idea. But when you think back on that now, how scary is it that you are less concerned about your health and more concerned about how you will be treated purely based on your sexuality? You know, it's a... It's an indictment on our society, isn't it? It's yeah. an indictment on our society. So, you know, it was very much suck it up, sweetheart. <laughs> so you got married to a woman and you actually had kids. I did. And what was that time of your life like? Um, it's uh, interesting, isn't it? I, um, I met uh, a woman at work um, and uh, I, I fell in love with her. I fell in love with her um, and, you know, over the period of time we had, you know, we had three kids um, and, you know, ultimately grateful for that, ultimately grateful for that. Love my kids. We were together for, I, I, think, I think, 16 years and that relationship actually didn't finish because I was gay. That relationship finished simply because, like any other couple, there were cracks that developed in that, in, over that period of time and it was better for us not to be together and better for the kids um, not to be together. And I've got to tell you, for that 16 years, I was looked at as a heterosexual man and on that basis I felt the safest, I felt the most comfortable, I felt absolutely the most accepted that I had ever felt in my entire life. Mm. And that was simply because, you know, I was conforming. And because of that, hey, my life was pretty good for that, uh, for that period of time. Eventually your marriage ended yep. when you were 42. Mm. And then you did come out. What was that process like? Oh. Um, scary. Uh, what happened was, um, you know, society changed a lot in that, you know, period of time. Um, and, you know, the relationship was over and I just, I actually didn't care what people said anymore. I was now at the point where um, I needed to be, I needed to be me. I needed to be me, yeah. And sometime later, you started a new relationship mm. with a man. I did. I met someone who uh, I thought 
uh, was my knight in shining armour. Um, and initially in that relationship, uh, he gave me all the indications that that's exactly what he would be. Um, I think I had three months of bliss um, and it was uh, about the three-month mark. Uh, it, was a, it was his birthday, actually, and we'd gone out for dinner. And, um, uh, you know, we had a lovely dinner, a uh, nice restaurant. We went to... He wanted to go to a club after and we went there. Um, a few of his mates were there, topping him up with booze. School night. Um, and so I said, you know, it's time for me to go home. Uh, you stay here. And so I went home, went to bed, went to sleep. And then all of a sudden I was woken up with something jumping on the bed. And I got, uh, like, woke up with a shock. Um, and I probably told him to get off or something. I, I don't remember. Anyway, he lost it. Started ranting and raving. So I followed him into the lounge room. And as I got to the lounge room, um, I felt a fist across my face. My nose was, you know, at right angles um, and uh, I then, you know, I, I then needed to get away from him to try and fix myself um, and I remember going into the bathroom, looking in the mirror and yeah, literally at right angles oh. and thinking to myself, how am I going to straighten this? Oh. Um, anyway, by that point he'd come into the bathroom and it was all very apologetic and... Uh, you know, it'll never happen again. You know, all the cliches mm. um, that at that point I didn't realise were cliches, by the way. And this is uh, three months never, into the relationship. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, we need to put that in context. Um, anyway, uh, I turned around and he grabbed my nose and he just oh. straightened it for me. Um, and, yeah, by that stage, you know, I was green under the eyes and, and, and I, I think... That was a car accident. I think I used the car accident excuse uh, for, that, for that one. But thought, in all honesty, thought that this was not ever going to happen again at that point. I'd never been in a gay relationship before and I kept on being told that, that you know, th this is how they work. This is how they work. And somewhere in the back of my head, I, I kept on thinking, well, n surely not. This is what gay relationships are. Yeah, look this is like. what this gay is relationships are. This is what relationships between men look like. This yes. is what it is. Yes. Um, and I just, there was something in the back of my head that kept saying, well, surely not. Because why would you stay in these? You know, this is, I'm feeling really uncomfortable in this and, um, and, and I'm losing myself. I've just found myself and now I'm losing myself. Again, um, but, you know, I mean, perpetrators are really good at manipulating you and looking for vulnerabilities and, and utilising their strengths against those vulnerabilities. And, um, uh, yeah, hey, five years later um, and I was completely a shell of mm. um, this newfound person that um, I thought I was. Mm. Did you feel that... After being married for a period of time, after having children, there was some degree of embarrassment or need to hide that this relationship that was a gay relationship, you didn't want people to know it was failing, you didn't really want people to know that you weren't happy. I had to make this relationship work. work. I'd left what was, ex what was an acceptable norm relationship, I'd gone out on, onto the mountaintops and told people that I was gay and, and that was a good thing. Yeah. I entered into a relationship that was terrible and I felt very much that it was my responsibility to make this thing work. Did you tell anybody what was happening to you at the time? Uh, there was one occasion that... And it was about the two and a half year mark and I, I'd just come back from hospital. I'd had my head bashed. Um, and I'd just come back from the hospital and uh, I was sitting in the, the lounge room alone and uh, I opened a, a, a gay rag and there was a, a, an advertisement for a helpline. 
and I picked up the phone to talk to this, to this helpline. So uh, I remember very nervously waiting on the end of the phone, not really, really knowing what I was going to say to uh, whoever answered. Anyway, they, they finally answered and I just blurted out everything. Like it was just like a roller coaster. Um, and when I finished, I remember so clearly the, uh, the person on the other end of the phone said to me, um, I'm sorry, but uh, this service doesn't have the capacity to deal with people uh, that have your chosen lifestyle. Even or, though they were advertising in a gay magazine. Yep. So instead of getting any form of assistance, yeah. I got homophobia from that service. Mm. I then thought to myself, obviously, I am getting what I deserve. And, you know, what, what I will do now is I will go back into that relationship and I've got to make this work somehow. People always ask domestic violence victims why, what they say is, you know, why don't they just leave? Very difficult to explain, very difficult to understand, but there are many reasons, aren't there, Russell? Well, it's a, it's a really stupid question. I actually think it's, it's one of the most stupid questions that you can ask somebody who is in... It's insulting, uh, isn't it? it? Yeah, it is. It is insulting. Yeah. Because and it's victim-blaming. It, absolutely victim-blaming. Yeah. And, and if you could leave, you would. Like, it's really simple. If you could leave those relationships, you would. And there are all sorts of reasons why you don't think you can. So how did you eventually get out of the relationship? Well... Uh, I ended up um, having my wrist chatted by him one night uh, in front of the kids. Um, he wandered off. He had his new love interest waiting in the car outside. Uh, so he wandered off. Um, I, you know, got myself off to the hospital and, uh, you know, I ended up having, you know, five hours of surgery to put this, this wrist back together. But what it did do is it took me away from everybody, mm. everything, and I had, you know, nursing staff and doctors and whatever that provided me with probably the safest environment that I'd been in uh, in the last, you know, five years. Um, and it gave me a lot of good time to think. And, you know, it, it, it was time for me not to be in that relationship, strangely enough, even, even thinking along those lines in the hospital, um, I would have taken him back. I would have taken him back. Um, and thankfully he didn't want to come. Bonus. When I look back at it now, uh, that was a bonus. But all he would have needed to have done at any period of time after this, clicked his fingers and uh, yeah, I would have gone back. And another common myth is that um, once you leave a relationship, you know, life, life moves forward positively and easily. Um, myth. <laughs> it's a myth. And we know, we know, don't we, that, yeah. that, you know, ultimately once you've got out, that is the time that you need the most intensive support. Yeah. Um, again, the system failed me at that point because... Um, had I been uh, a woman, um, whilst the system isn't great or wasn't great, getting better, thank you, Rosie, um, but whilst it, whilst it, it wasn't great, um, it was there. Well, we have refuges, don't we? Well, yeah, refuges. We may not have enough, we may not have as you know, many, but there are some places that women can go to be safe and I guess... When we look at um, male victims of violence and particularly gay male victims of violence, um, you haven't got that safety um, avenue. And um... my offer, my offer or my option uh, was a homeless men's shelter yeah. um, with a 12-year-old daughter. Yeah. Like not an option at all. I actually got to the very lowest ebb of the whole situation. Um, during that period, um, to the point where I contemplated suicide, um, because it seemed the only way out for me. I went to the absolute darkest uh, 
place I think I've ever been in my life. Um, and how did you start to heal? Well, I, um, I started to sing again. I, I, had some, I had some friends who were professional musicians and they asked me to come over for dinner one night and I, I went over and uh, we had dinner and they said, come downstairs. They had a recording studio downstairs. They said, come downstairs and we'll, um, well, we're going to put some stuff together. And so I sang three songs and um, I played it for one of my friends who then took it to a club um, and the next thing I'm get, I got phone calls saying, you know, we want to book you to do Saturday nights or whatever. And so I literally... I literally found my voice again through music. Um, and I guess that's part of the reason why um, we wanted to do my other closet, the cabaret, because um, music, uh, music, uh, music was my escape in the relationship. Music was the way I found my voice outside the relationship. And music is the way that I've been able to spread the word about how people don't have to live in relationships like this. So it's, it's, it's been the, the, the most amazing part of um, the journey for me. So your cabaret show was such a huge success. Has it all come as a surprise to you that you've been able to channel your, you know, your passion in this way and your life experience? Uh, yeah. I, I think people deal with trauma in different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I don't believe there's any right way or any wrong way to deal with it. You know, it's your own I think unique journey, isn't it's it? an individual yeah. journey, and, and you do what's the best, what's yeah. best for you. Uh, Matthew, my husband, and I uh, were in. Um, uh, we were at the the Adelaide Fringe in 2012, I think it was. We decided after seeing these shows that what we'd like to do is like, we'd, we'd like to put together a show ourselves. We're sitting in a hotel room, we're having this discussion, and then Matt says to me, whenever you're gonna do something, you should do something that you have uh, um, uh, a special knowledge of. And so we looked at each other and we've gone, oh, we know, intimate partner violence. Yes, we'll write a cabaret about intimate partner violence. That'll be a seller. A cabaret with glittering sets, dazzling reviews, Yes, I'm the great pretender. It is quite an unlikely pairing, I will say. Absolutely. Although, mm. although we decided to use the cabaret format because traditionally cabaret was used to talk about political and social issues. I wanted people to understand that you know, all relationships, irrespective of whether they're heterosexual or LGBTIQ, can experience this. It doesn't discriminate. And I wanted other people in my communities to be able to have a, a name to put to that experience that they're having that I didn't have. I didn't have that name. So... Um, and it's been really successful. So the, the audience you were aiming for were others from the gay community? Initially. Exactly. <laughs> initially, and, initially. And what was the reaction? What, what, what ended up being the Well, outcome? interestingly, you know, we would, put, we would advertise to the LGBTIQ community initially and 50% um, of our audience were cisgender heterosexual women who um, had experienced or had friends who were experienced. I do remember asking... Um, you know, a couple of audience members after one of the shows, you know, what, what was the draw card? Um, and they told me that having a, like, this berry gay guy standing on the stage um, talking about their experience was the least th threatening thing that they ever experienced. So over a period of time, we actually moved away from just presenting this as, a, as an LGBTIQ thing and presenting it more as a, a victim survivor's experience um, who just happens to be gay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Has this change in career and purpose been a surprise to you? Yeah, I was, um, 
Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an accidental advocate. Like, I, you know, I never, ever, I never, ever thought um, that uh, this would be the, the, the place that I'd be at. Um, I'm very grateful that I am. I'm very grateful that I am. It's no longer good enough for LGBTIQ people or those in other marginalised groups to be an afterthought in the broader family violence conversation or to have to fight to get support. The more that I was uh, becoming involved in the show and then advocacy, uh, the more failings I was seeing um, in, a, in the system, um, and not only, not only to LGBTIQ people, but to all people who are experiencing it, trying to access um, systems that just weren't working for them. Um, and so, in incredibly whilst, you know, my passion is to make sure that there are pathways for GBTQ men um, and that there um, is uh, uh, equal, uh, equal service provision for LGBTIQ people. Um, whenever I'm speaking these days, I, you know, I always highlight the fact that the majority of the cases of family violence in this country are men's violence against women um, and that, you know, there needs to be uh, service provision for those people um, and it doesn't take away from any of that service provision to be able to provide services to marginalised groups. And you're happily married now to your manager, Matt. I truly am. What have you learned about a healthy gay relationship uh, between well, two men? I think, well, between anybody, Rosie, a healthy relationship is a relationship where, number one, you're equal in each other's eyes. Number two, where you actually care more about them than you do yourself. And you don't have to think about yourself because you know that they're thinking about you and they're caring about you and they're looking after you. Um, so, you know, a beautiful, a beautiful relationship of equality um, is the perfect relationship for everybody. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Russell Vickery, thank you for joining me on One Plus One. Absolute pleasure, Rosie. Thanks for having me.